Hello everyone, we are here for this first episode uh, of uh, Betting Table Talks, where we have uh, a series of panelists. In this case, we have uh, Peter Sainsbury, who is a professional gambler on Formula One and uh, an investor in commodity. Lorenzo, who is uh, the founder of uh, Mercurius and head of data scientist, and Anthony Kaminskas, uh, ex-trader at Betfair and Paddy Power and a professional gambler. So if you ever wanted to ask questions, guys, just click the button, ask a question and type it there. The topic of this uh, webinar or table talk is about uh, how to evaluate uh, a betting performance because it's not as simple uh, as people know. Obviously in the long term uh, is just the profit, but uh, reaching the long term, you need to have uh, better tools and metrics uh, to to understand it. So guys, if you want to introduce yourself, maybe telling you a bit of your history, we can start with you, Anthony. <laughs> I get the short straw. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> <yeah. laughs> Anthony, just uh, from Manchester, um, live in Dublin in Ireland, been in Ireland since 2008, um, moved to Ireland basically after mm -hmm. university, an economics degree from a, from a small university in England. Um, and moved to Dublin to work for Paddy Power uh, at the time. Worked for Paddy Power for five years. That became Paddy Power Betfair in around 2013. Uh, worked for them for another five years and yeah, basically left in March 2018, handed in my notice and uh, I've been gambling professionally, you might say, um, since then. Um, so yeah, the guts of three years of which, of which a year of it was in a pandemic. <laughs> Uh, Peter, what yeah, about uh, you? Yeah, uh, uh, Peter Sainsbury. Um, I, uh, like Anthony, actually, I, I didn't realize um, we both got uh, an economics background. Um, but I, I went in and uh, actually became an economist for uh, several years after that. Um, but you know, over the last 10, 20 years, I've um, been very much focused on Formula One, um, investing on Formula One. Uh, and that's kind of prompted me to get involved with um, markets, you know, particularly commodity markets, and um, you know, you know, very much focused on investing in that area, but uh, also writing, uh, writing a lot about um, yeah, my views on the markets and, and, uh, and how to interpret different, uh, different environments. Okay, and you, Lorenzo, probably some of the listeners already know you, but still maybe there is yeah. some new guys. In case you didn't notice, I'm an Italian guy, uh, 28. Uh, I'm a physical engineer, but by degree, so basically studied a lot of you know bad stuff, ranging from nanotechnology, quantum physics, and you know simulating complex systems. And then I really understood that my my life wasn't meant to stay into academia at all. So I wanted to have you know a real impact on the world, and I started working in you know uh, projects for telco energy enterprises you know leveraging uh, modeling skills data skills and you know simulation and optimization techniques that i've learned at university and 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 these basically paved the way to 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 learn about digital innovation and how data in general was disrupting many industries and and that's where i basically ended up found mercurius some some years ago and, and now I'm here talking with, you know, some clever guys, which makes me think I made a good choice. <laughs> okay, so uh, as a first question, as an icebreaker, uh, I think that this is a cool one. So, Anthony, what made you gain the necessary confidence to pursue sports betting as a career? Um... I've never lacked confidence. Um, <laughs> sometimes to my detriment. Um, yeah, just um, I think just when you're working in a job, and like I originally really enjoyed my job. Um, everything that I did was a lot of a lot of odd compilation. The risk management was interesting because you weren't dealing with the way sports books have evolved. You were dealing with the the type of customer is not very smart all the guys that are left are kind of like the easy fish um and i you kind of you kind of learn from the smart people and one sport books are getting rid of smart, many left betting with them so you don't really learn that much so just in my last years i wasn't learning that much i felt that 
I've kind of stalled in that in that way. Um, and just I was making just making a lot more money gambling than I was um, from my salary. And um, so I was just doing my 45, 50 hours a week, 45 probably for Paddy Fair back there. Um, and then probably doing 55, 60 hours on top of that for myself. Um, and really, really, really working hard at the gambling to build up a big enough bankroll to basically take the plunge and do it myself. So once I once I got to that stage, it was a case of just getting the mortgage for the house. And then once that was secured to the, the bank, job history was kicked off i could then leave my job once the mortgage was secured um and then go down the go down the gambling route and uh yeah the co- the confidence I've, I've never lacked confidence to be honest with you but and i've always thought what i've been doing is right but i'm also i like learning off other people like i just like surrounding myself with people that are more intelligent than me or what if i'm more intelligent than me or can teach me things um so that's why i'm half why i'm here as well and um, so it's always good to just be surrounded by learning new things of people that you think can teach you new things and that had kind of stalled in the in the, in the employment world uh, and i was happy enough to go my own way and like i say it's uh, it's gone it's gone really well it's gone better than i thought time i have more time i find i have more time just to do family things take days off when i want and uh, also more time to i think when you work for a boat maker you don't realize how many markets there are in all different parts of the world and you just don't have time to be on top of absolutely everything. Um, and I've found that just being on top of everything is basically been able to make a, make a lot more money for less time as well than what I was doing in my job. So, um, yeah, more efficient and making more money and just, just ideas that you have in your own head kind of, kind of prove them you know, through a bit of trial and error and, yeah, make a few quid. And that's uh, it's kind of the way I've gone about it. And just trying to scale, 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 scale all the time. And just trying to get bigger and bigger, and it's basically it's so I can have, so me and my family can have a, a better life, essentially. And you, Peter, because you started pretty young on Formula One. Yeah, no, so I was definitely an adult uh, when I started. So uh, yeah, it's totally legal to bet uh, when I started. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's what I mean. It's always been. Um, yeah, I guess I like. Um, I, I mentioned I. I did uh, you know learned economics when I was um, you know when I was in my late teens and in uh, university and then you know there's that intellectual sort of challenge about trying to understand cause and effect and trying to predict the future um, and kind of betting on Formula One was a kind of a um, a low stake low risk way of kind of putting those skills into practice I guess at the time. Um, and that's kind of something I've just you know, really enjoyed over those those years to sort of gradually build up and you know, you know again like like Anthony said really kind of building confidence in, in what the process you've built up and um, you know your understanding and, 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 you know, and perhaps some of the things we'll come to later on about understanding you know volatility and you know, how things change over time. Um, but then yeah you know, when you get to a certain stage you you built up that confidence to know that um, you know you've got a certain uh, you know, support behind you that enables you to, you know, make that jump. Um, that, you know, it, that does that is a is a big leap of faith for sure, and uh, you know, it does, that does take time to build up that confidence. Lorenzo, in your case, what was giving you the confidence? Yeah, to definitely, it? it requires mm-hmm. some sort of uh, leap of faith or a lot of confidence, like like Anthony has, for example. <laughs> but in, in my case, was something maybe stupid that, that happened. So I really got blocked by the first book that I kind of respected that at the time were William Hill and, and B. Win. So that, 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 that's the end of the story. But actually what it really opened my eyes was the fact that, of course, I kind of liked and I'm trying to understand the, the, the intellectual challenge, like, like uh, Peter said, in you know, understanding how pricing works, how the financial you know, mathematics that's behind sports betting works. So that the first block was basically knowing that I understood how the system worked. So that, that was, of course, the first block. And then it didn't, it came quite natural to me to you know, understand, you know, the power of value betting and how, you know, you can make a living out of it. And I was, it helped also a lot to me that I was particularly exposed to some bright people making a living of poker, professional poker playing. So actually my roommate was making a living 
living out of it, was paying his study. And that, that really was an example for me to understand that it was doable. So that, that like by, by example, it was extremely easy to understand. But what, when I actually understood that it was enough to, to start, in, let's say, uh, going through a, a journey, uh, was the fact that actually I was damaging someone. So actually, without something really sophisticated, we had a system to spot really mispricing on minor leagues. We didn't know that actually it would have made sense to not barn those soft accounts, something I... Lorenzo, you blocked uh, the... We were placing large... Okay. Okay, okay, um, now it works. Did you lose me? You're back, yeah. you. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. And so basically, when when we started placing these single bets on you know minor markets uh, and and actually made made some nice money out of it, then that's where I understood it made sense to to, to pursue this kind of value betting approach and actually found a company on top of it. So that was the main uh, trigger for me, just to be you know that you have done something not that bad when you you maybe. Uh, have some also negative reaction mm -hmm. to it, right? it speak mm -hmm. maybe more than, than appraisal sometimes. Yeah, so that was... Uh, okay, L let's move uh, in the topic of the debate, which is uh, how to measure a performance and which are the important uh, metrics to take into account. So uh, we can start with Anthony. So which are the important metrics to use for uh, evaluating a betting performance and how do you evaluate it? Yeah, so I just think for me personally, um, just the best metric to use would be closing line value. I think um, I was saying to somebody recently, um, just that 98% of the time, I think it's it's efficient, it's a good barometer for not much work. Um, I think we can all like, we can all talk about how efficient markets are and efficient market hypothesis, and we can all have our own views on that. I just think as a, a an individual level, I think we cannot find plenty of flaws in it. I think at a big collective level, I think it's fairly efficient and it's not over a, over a big sample of markets. I think the majority of markets are going to be fine, but you can find your niches in in mistakes in markets that not every market is fine, even though a closing line might be accurate over a, over, over a big sum of events. Um, so yeah, just I use closing line value. You can scrape that various ways. Like I think that's what I would have done originally and measured myself against. Just as I've got further down the journey of betting and just betting day to day, constantly being in, in, immersed in it and changing my process to try and get better and better. I kind of don't, I don't massively track it as much as I used to do, just because I, I think it's kind of it's almost not. It's almost a given with the majority of the bets I'm going to be placing that I'm going to be getting closing line value. And I think just if you're betting, it's just the place you need to be. Um, we can all have swings in the short term and variance and things moving around and you, you ride the variance wave. Um, and that's all about managing your bankroll correctly um, to, to ensure you stay in the game, basically, and, 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 and don't lose too much of a, of a bankroll. Um, and we can all have different opinions on Kelly and Kelly criterion and half a Kelly and quarter Kelly. And that's just not something I've ever used just because my strategy is I'm betting into markets where I don't really know if I'm going to be accommodated on bets that I want. So I don't know if my Kelly strategy is even applicable. It tends not to be. If, if I wanted to do it, I don't think I could do it because I can't, yeah. can't guarantee I'm going to get, I can't guarantee I'm going to get 0.5% of my bankroll on something. It's just not possible. So. I kind of just I kind of just go by feel with a lot of markets and um, how much I want. And my general rule is the bigger the mistake, the more I have on relatively. Like if if I find if I find a one thousand to one shot that should be two hundred to one, like it's, it's a it's an okay mistake. But like you're not going to be sticking out uh, a lot of your bankroll on that just because of the variance. So like it's uh, but the bigger the the bigger the discrepancy at the front end of the market, for example, I'll be trying to have more money on. So. If, I, if I, there's an even money shot that I make four to seven or two point that I make one point five seven, um, I'll be having a I'll be having a good bet on that basically, and uh, I don't characterize it as is it going to be one percent of my bankroll? Is it going to be one point five percent of my bank? I'm just not that bothered. But in my head, 
I'm just trying to get more on the bigger mistakes that I can find, basically, and that's just my general rule. But going back to your question, closing line, um, if there are eyes on the market is what I say, just like markets you can find, you might think certain markets are okay, but you might find some sub market to a market being offered on a Georgian bookmaker, um, <laughs> a jar of it or somebody like that. Um, and there might, there might just not be eyes on that market and it might close at a certain price and the closing line wouldn't be the barometer that you'd use for how good your bet is basically. So, and also another thing is that bookmakers can also massively overreact to your bet as well. You might make something 1.85, you have a good bet of 1.95, they go 1.7 or you can't really use 1.7. I kind of, my closing line is kind of the price I make it basically. And I measure myself off my own, <laughs> what my own true price is. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to get better with my own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to get better with my own prices and that, that should dictate if my price is right, I should be okay. So uh, before I asking the same question to Peter, uh, for you that are watching, if you want to ask questions that you want us to answer during this, uh, Table talk, you can just click the button, ask a questions, and we will try to answer them during this talking. So, Peter, which are the important metrics in your case, and how do you evaluate your betting performance? Yeah, uh, I was interested in listening to uh, Anthony respond to your question because, like, you know, I think we talked about you know, before we uh, started the evening, yeah, things like closing line are less. Um, you know, less relevant for people like from the one markets where you know they're very can be very illiquid and very opaque and you know sometimes very you get very little movement um you know in, into the into the start of the race sometimes depending on the on the, the market. Um so yeah I, I, that's not something necessarily I you know, particularly pay attention to um other than perhaps for some of the you know, um, certain markets like the you know the winner you know winner of the race market, for example. Um, but I guess yeah, you know, I guess overall, it, in terms of what I pay attention to, it's um, and I, I think it, you know it, it relates to you know how much sort of volatility in terms of returns I'm you know, willing to um, to stomach. And you know, I'm tend to be tried someone who tries to um, you know spot. But, you know, like Anthony, I guess, you know, things that are badly mispriced, but I'm, I'm probably much more happier and, and content looking at things that are, you know, that could be, um, you know, priced at 20 to 1, but that should be 5 to 1, uh, for example, <clears throat> something like that. And, um, you know, so I'm, in a way, I'm then, so I could have a lot of, a lot, you know, long string of losers, effectively, you know, you know, mm -hmm. passing that way. <clears throat> But I know through, you know, through the process and through, you know, over time that, you know, if I can, um, you know, if the expected value from each of those bets exceeds the, you know, the, the price that I get, and then, you know, over time I know I can, I can um, make a, a, good, a good return. And so I guess it's, yeah, that, I guess those are some of the things I pay attention to. Um, and then, yeah, I guess overall, I, I just feel like I've got to be quite careful to about paying attention to certain metrics because I find sometimes they can actually influence your decision making. If you, you know, if you're focused on um, like a closing line or um, you know, a strike rate or you know, a, a winning streak, you know, sometimes you become wedded to that, that particular metric when that's actually not always that important. It's the the process that's, that's, that's important uh, over the long term. Lorenzo, well, <laughs> what about I, you? I kind of, uh, surprisingly, I kind of agree with both. Um, so I, I really, I mean, and also with Carlo, so the ultimate metric is, of course, profitability. You really, what it really does matter if we are making profit or, or are we being right, which is something, you know, ephemeral somehow. So on the long term, it's obvious that the main metric should be uh, uh, one of the possible metrics of profitability, ROI, yield, you name it. I, I guess the problem is, maybe it's obvious, but it's 
when the sample size is small, maybe compared to the expected volatility of, of your what it really found extremely. Uh, did, did you lose me? Because maybe the yeah, connection is I, 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 yeah, like for one second. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, so, so basically, what I I I really like is uh, to find the so-called proxy metrics. For for example, a really good one is the closing line value, which is so, a metric that that on in general reacts, you know, in a well-behaved way, uh, in, in both in the let's say medium and in the long term. So this is something. I strongly advise to, to look into, especially if your approach is something like Anthony's. For example, I assume that you bet a lot early in, 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 in the odds like cycle. Maybe yeah, yeah. Maybe. Quite early, and then it makes a lot. Yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. Yes, we lost you, Lorenzo, um, again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me try to close the camera. Maybe it's shouting a little bit. Okay. So, but, but we, okay. we lost you. <laughs> okay. There is a webinar without the friend. So. <laughs> okay. So, so, yes, Lorenzo, you was okay. uh, asking Anthony that uh, if he bets early or uh, yeah, exactly. closer to the closing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For, for me personally, it just depends on the market. It depends, depends how much I'm looking to get down in the market. It depends how inefficient i reckon the price is going to last for and and continue to be inefficient for i think if i think i've got you basically want to bet as close to the off as you can just to, to get to get more amounts of money on but then you also have to okay. you also have to, the trade-off is also what price and how the price is going to react closer to the off and is the price going to come in if the price is going to come in very slightly and you can get a hell of a lot more money on and that might be a better option if you're trying to scale and things like that. So there's a, there's a lot of things to consider basically. Yeah, and, and it's it's pretty similar to the spot I, I'm I'm used to, for example, because we tend to sh to bet on sharp bookmakers. Uh, so I mean, uh, and t and tend to to bet also close to the kickoff. So it's it's really quite hard to see strong deviation from the closing line if you are betting close to it, of course, right? So. Um, yeah. What I really find extremely useful, at least in our in our system, in our methodology, is to find maybe, and this is more similar to Peter's, maybe, is to find some metrics in the underlying phenomenon you are modeling. So, for example, in soccer, uh, we keep track of some intermediate metrics, which we really have a strong predictive power on, and we keep monitoring if this accuracy is 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 kept constant over time. And despite what the actual PNL might might do in the short term, if these metrics are stable, then we are pretty confident that the algorithms are still working and finding an edge over the market. Whereas if some sort of divergency happens, then it's it might be an alarming sign and maybe you need to devise a, a, a better approach. But I really agree that you really need to trust the process as long as the outcomes are not enough in terms of sample size. So uh, it really helps to measure every single intermediate step and see if, if it's consistent and if it's also consistent with the variance you are expecting. So as Peter said, of course, if you're betting 20 to 1, you're not expecting to win uh, uh, all of them, of course, right? So it's, it's pretty straightforward to, to, to maybe make some Monte Carlo simulation on you know, what the expected level of variance that you have. And I really think those proxy variables really help you a lot. But if you bet, you know, early in the markets and you have, you know, an approach that should discount information, I agree that the closing line value sh or, or should be, you know, the main, probably the main, the main metric to, to look after. Guys, there is a beautiful, uh, interesting question here in the chat from Alexandro. And uh, it's for all of you trees. And it is what metrics do you look at to improve the timing of the bet? Uh, Good one. Yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> yeah, for me, for me personally, it's just I think there's an experience angle of if you're looking at a certain market, experience of when if it's a football market and under an Asian handicap or over and under two and a half goals, um, it can just be you're trying to anticipate sometimes when some of the actual big players in the market, not myself or Peter, some of the real big players in the market are going to enter the market. 
Um, like timing, timing is kind of key for just trying to anticipate certain things and learn just from when prices move at certain times. Um, I think just for me, it's just, a lot of it's to do with limits. I'm trying to work out when limits are going to be raised. So when markets go up initially, like you're always going to get the bottom feeders that are going to max out a 300 quid market at the start of the week um, and move a line five cents or whatever. Um, and it's just trying to trade off whether you want to take that 300 quid or you want to wait further down the line thinking that once you move five cents, you're going to still have value in the price and um, for a lot higher limit um, and be able to hit harder. And it's all about scale, basically. All trying to just trying to scale using those questions of, when you think other people like there'll be for certain markets that I bet into on say for example golf in the UK um you'd see I kind of subscribe to anybody who can move a market and it might not be somebody I respect but it might be somebody who has a following so if I have my list of players that I want to back but some guy with a following who I might not respect is playing the same player I kind of might need to go to market a little bit earlier, knowing that that price just isn't going to exist no matter what happens, just because the following is going to change the price basically. So like I just try and keep abreast of who's who's entering the market and who can influence the market and that would help. And that along with when limits are going to be raised are kind of the two main questions that I'm looking at basically. And you, Peter, because your market is pretty strange, it seems it's a for yeah. one from what we're doing. <laughs> Uh, I think, um, yeah, I think Andy's right in the end in terms of how, how, deep, uh, how deep the markets are at any one point. You know, it's important who's, who's on different sides of the trade. Uh, but yeah, like, as you say, like with Formula One, it's different like, in some respects because the weekend evolves, um, you know, the Friday practice and things, you know, form becomes clearer on Friday and you've got qualifying. You've got an order that races stuff, you know, starts. So it's kind of about balancing my sort of fundamental view and outlook for the weekend um, and how it evolves during the week, and then making sure I'm, you know, sometimes ahead of, you know, my best on things, you know, you know midweek ahead of a race on Sunday. Um, you know, it, it all depends on how I think. You know, the whole weekend is going to evolve and then how that's going to influence other people's uh, decisions as to you know, how much money to back on a certain driver or team. So, yeah, it, it's kind of you know, anticipating how the whole weekend is going to evolve and then you know, reacting accordingly. Peter's being met very modest. Peter is the Formula One market. Peter. Probably. Both sides of the trade, yeah. <laughs> I've got I'm a theory. Get in the middle. Yeah. My, my theory is that in that market, the, the participants are Peter and three Italian guys from Maranello. Like the market. Otto Wolves uh, have been known to have a few few bets as well. Oh, has he? <laughs> okay, uh, here we have uh, a question from uh, Tony, which is how do you balance? taking an early price against varying impacting factors. In example, team sheets not published, late jockey changes, etc. Yeah, do you want me to answer or? Yeah, you guys, you can uh, go on start. it uh, how you, you want. <laughs> Sorry for missing the party for a little bit, man. I have bad connection apparently. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the worst moment possible, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, just okay. in just in response to that, just um, late jockey changes would be very rare. So that's just not really something I'd be factoring in at all. That'd be yeah, that that'd be very very rare to be honest with you. Um, team news, some of the stuff, some of the stuff we're involved in is we're trying to find out team news before it becomes public. That's just one of the things we're trying to do um, be certain teams so we can get the team news early before it, hits, before it hits Twitter or before Ben Dinnery tweets what Premier League players are playing and things like that. And so, yeah, just you're trying to, you can, you can wait for, th I think there's two approaches. You can wait for things and try and be the first to react when, when news stories hit, or you can try and build up a network to try and get the news story before it comes public. Um, and, 
I'd just rather be the latter of those two options. I want to, I want to be the first guy knowing everything if I can, and it's not always possible, and it's rarely possible. But like, you're just trying to get information from and any asymmetric information you can find is uh, can be very very profitable. I know that Peter. Me and Peter might have been talking about when Lewis Hamilton got COVID and George Russell, I think, was driving last year and he was 500 to 1. And I think he might have gone off a bit 5 to 4 or 6 to 4 for the race. And he was about 10s on, wasn't he, and running and got beat. Um, like, so things like that, when you can find those instances, like uh, an example that I would have had was I found out about 15, it was only about 15 minutes before it broke, but when Saracen's got the big points deduction in Rugby Union, um, and they would have been favourites for the league. They would have been favourites for the Heineken Cup. Um, and just trying to get as much money on Exeter as you could before the story broke, basically. And just trying to just trying to build a network where you can get information first is going to give you a massive edge, basically. There was a Harabolos Volgaris when he was betting on baseball at the time that he was looking at the Instagram profiles of the basketball players to see if the night before they were partying because it could have been an indicator <laughs> that they wouldn't show up the next day or that the match wasn't that uh, that serious. And in, in, in your case, Peter, because on a Formula One, you have, you know, the preparation lapses, the weather as well changes and impact uh, also the betting partners, uh, if I'm correct, yeah. from what I read in your book, at least. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, I've just, uh, I mean, there's, there's a few things that, you know, dramatically, Alter the odds um, in the same way that you know what Anthony mentioned about you know George Russell and taking uh, taking Hamilton's seat last year. Um, but yeah, things like um, sort of grid grid penalties and you know, make a big difference depending if you know it's, it's like at Monaco or somewhere where the driver can't you know very difficult to overtake. Um, but yeah, I mean just to in terms of like the question, you know the the bit. Example I can think of goes back like to 2005, I think it was, when um, Michelin uh, pulled out of the US US Grand Prix from um, Indianapolis, and there was only six, only six, six cars um, out of the 20 in the field, um, and that, that was a good that was a good day for me. Was, uh, one, of the, <laughs> one of the best days I can remember. <laughs> so that was that was a uh, a decade and a half ago, so they don't come around very often. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. when they, uh, when they come. Good. so L Lorenzo, if you are still online because uh, uh, your connection is bad, uh, do, how do you balance this uh, entering uh, into the market uh, against uh, the varying uh, different factors like as liquidity, for example, uh, or uh, information? You're muted, Lorenzo. You have to mute you. Lorenzo, say uh, you're muted. <laughs> you can't, uh, okay, no, he can't unmute himself. So, okay, guys, is it the first time? Sorry for everyone. To everyone, with the first time we're organizing this table talk, and apparently it started already. You know, the other. The other. The other example I remember that Peter was talking about Michelin. I remember, was it Braun when Braun won the championship? There was that pre-season or whatever you call it, the 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 testing, yeah. the testing before the start of the season, um, and Braun were a hundred to one, I think, for the constructors' championship. And very very quickly, it became apparent that mm. they were they were superior to everyone else. And they that's the that's one of the biggest moves I've ever seen for an anti-post market. They went from a hundred to one to very very short didn't they just based on what yeah. was that, that year so I'm very, um, I'm okay very, uh, i don't know sporting sporting index had a had a market on where hamilton would qualify and um they had it came out to like 22 you know to, to qualify 22nd when it was a field of 24 and then right. i think he planted it planted it on pole and, uh, yeah 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 so Lorenzo, since I will try. Back. Okay, yeah. finally seems working. Okay, so uh, we didn't hear you about the question from Tony, which is uh, how do you balance taking an early price against varying impacting factors? In example, uh, 
team sheets not published, the late jockey changes, etc. Uh, we, we, we tend to add not, not so early, as I was saying before. So we generally try to bet when either the, the news is already discounted or, or nearly to completely discounted. So we really don't bet so early in order to, you know, we have, you know, automatic data-driven models. So news are a big, big factor. So we really try to avoid staying, uh, uh, you know, in the spot where news are, are, are huge. Uh, and maybe would require, you know, human intervention or like a human in the loop system. So, and of course, maybe it was more relevant for, for the previous question, but we also need to scale a lot on liquidity. So as Anthony was saying, it doesn't really add much value if you're just putting down some pocket money uh, really early. So in order not to give up information too early and also not to have you know, pitfalls in our model, we tend to, 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 to stay close to the kickoff in order not to, you know, find blind spots, which, which would be really bad to, to, to handle. So we stay, tend to stay close to the kickoff where all the info is there. Okay, so this has been answered. Let's check uh, uh, another one. Okay, this one from Patrick McCormack, which also is a question I wanted to ask you guys. So happy that someone else asked it, is what is the most valuable advice you have ever given or been given? This is <laughs> some secret sauce, <laughs> like uh, searching. Uh, maybe maybe uh, I go first, otherwise I okay. lose my chance. <laughs> I take my... <laughs> um, so I, I would say maybe, uh, I mean, uh, I, the, the single most p uh, useful piece of advice is to trust more what people do than what people say, which is a kind of a corollary of the skin in the game, let's say theorem. Uh, and also um, really seek industry feedbacks and don't have, don't be afraid of asking for help, feedback. We live in an industry where, you know, there are a lot of open-minded people. It still is com com a, a lot of competition in here, but there is also a kind of, good collaborational environment so you really can learn from the best and this is something i was really shy at the beginning uh, i was maybe too humble not confident enough to maybe ask for opinion feedback so that was the single advice i would give to you know a beginner to ask from the experts it's it's always good to learn from mistakes even matter if the mistakes are made by other people i would say so uh, I would, I would, I would try to minimize this cost, but uh, you know, also mistakes are learned uh, useful for you know your 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 professional path, your your building your own way of thinking, and the last one I would say, um, I mean, I love Italy, but maybe don't run uh, um, a betting business in such a you know not so business friendly country. Uh, so that that was that, that, that a personal entrepreneurial. Con suggestion I would give to, to my peers um, and to just close don't try to do everything just start maybe some a niche you can you know maybe have an edge on and really refine your craft and maybe then try to land and expand not try to be from day zero a generalist for example that that, that that's only my, my two cents maybe maybe you guys have different opinions on it Peter, if you want to add uh, something, your, your advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, I'd, I'd say, um, <laughs> what, uh, you know, if I, if I, if I say, Steve, is to you really sort of do your own research and you know, develop your own uh, methodology, your own conviction. Because um, without that, you know, none of what we, we talked about today you know, means anything. You know, you know, you're not able to monitor how well you're doing. You're not, to monitor how the, you know, the process that you put in place. Um, uh, and you won't know if you, you've just been lucky, you know, beginner's luck, or um, you actually have some edge that you might be able to develop and you know, sustain for the future. So, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be my uh, that's a bit of advice I've received. From you, Anthony? Yeah, I think that's right what Peter says. Like, I think. Um... Mm -hmm. I'd agree with that. Um, I think I don't know. It's a tough one to answer, to be honest. My my uh, 
my mother always says, be nice to the people on the way up because you'll pass them on the way down. So uh, I think that's always a good uh, a good little rule of life to live by. Just be be, be fairly nice to people. Um, but just just regarding the betting side of things, um, one of the one of the one of the best things I ever and I, I totally agree with it is uh, just 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 keep your mouth shut and keep your ears open. Like um, just as talking. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a really good one. Just listen, listen, listen. Take in as much as you can, and Jesus, for for I've 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 been on a couple of podcasts recently, so I probably can't talk too much. But um, just listening to other people, and you learn you learn so much off other people. You learn you learn from people that ninety nine percent of the, what they say is absolutely rubbish. But if you listen to them, you might just pick up something in the one percent that teaches you something. So yeah, just respectful and listen listen to anyone and the information properly basically but and nice sorry go go lorenzo but, but you, you stop it <laughs> do you have some <laughs> advice uh damn okay now, now it works now it works. Um, you're back you're back you're back okay okay so what's what's your your piece of advice in terms of methodological you know approach what you would you give to a new practitioner for example i think um uh, I think I think it's different from whatever your speciality is, whatever 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 way you're approaching it. The way I approach it is, I price a lot of my own stuff, and I deal with people that price their own stuff as well in their own specific areas. So like, okay, I I I don't like I don't like following people. I like not not leading people, but like I like being fully aware of the logic behind something. I don't like someone saying to me, "Bet this at this price now," and then that's the end of the conversation. I think you need to like. I, I I get a lot more enjoyment being involved in the process of finding out why something is a bet, um, rather than just following someone who says bet this at this price. I kind of want to, I kind of want to learn and delve into why they think it's the price, and then do my own analysis on it. Um, you have nobody else to blame if you're doing your own stuff and you you you're backing up, um, your own bets with your own opinions. Um, I just I. I can't abide by just following somebody and um, placing a bet on what they say without without really understanding their logic and the background of it, basically. Okay, okay. guys, getting back um, uh, on the performance evaluation. Huh? So all of you uh, doesn't started uh, as a sharps yet. There was a, a, le a learning process. Uh, of course, M maybe not, not uh, in Anthony case because it started already in the industry, but like uh, how this process of uh, evaluating performance changes across, uh, changed for you guys across the years? Mm, maybe I go first, I, I take the chance as always. Um, so in, in my case, it was, I mean, my approach is really, you know, we make, I made a, I make a lot of back tests, and so I, I really think if I'm looking back at the beginning, I was kind of fooled by randomness a lot. Uh, I mean, in retrospective, I, I would say so. I would really pay more and more attention on challenging continuously your assumptions and in your workflow, and you know, trying to let's say, uh, demystify your own approach to see how robust it is also over time. That, that That's something I really learned along the way. Uh, you know, at the, at, when you're super young, you, you have some sort of overconfidence on, or hubris, so you, you feel you are really superior with respect to the market. Then you learn to respect when, when, when maybe you take some bet and, and, and it bleeds. So that's, that's, that's something really relevant. And slightly, Maybe I we have I have a different um, also need which is also communicating to customers. Maybe this is something you you really either don't want to do or don't need to do, and and this requires a little bit of trade off between explaining stuff and you know also the methodological approach that you use. So recently we have to basically devise some sort of new metrics in order to explain uh, to customer how to assess the performance in a short period of time, for example, where maybe, as you can guess, maybe you have a high variance after, I don't know, six months, and you, we really needed to help them understanding that, you know, the, the, the profit that we were not uh, achieving so far, it was just a matter of time and, you know, of, of 
possible scenarios that could happen and you are basically now on you know a low probability one it's just a matter of time until you you converge to the true one so i from my perspective it really changed a lot also the fact that i had to, to communicate with others and this this was quite you know challenging also because you know it's not very easy to to communicate especially when you know you're also setting and managing other people's expectations also the opposite when you have a high profit uh, in a yeah. small uh, it's a more small time frame and you are all hype that, that you found uh, the 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 sucker the golden duck you know <laughs> like yeah. yeah yeah actually maybe the false the false positive is even you know more more dangerous because you you are basically survivorship bias at its best so i may, maybe it's even more you know relevant to 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 signal when things are too good yeah I think it's probably, somewhere in the middle isn't it it's like when you're doing really well it's probably you're probably not as good as you think you are <laughs> and, when, <laughs> and, when, yeah. and when you're doing really bad it's not it's not actually it's somewhere in the middle yeah. there's a there's a there's a middle ground to, to both those situations so peter how do you did, did you improve and change your way of evaluating your performance across these years or not yeah, no, I think um, I mean, it's a bit similar to uh, what Lorenzo uh, explained it, but I kind of almost explain it to myself. Um, so it, it's kind of what I, I, I developed over the years is a kind of a, a sort of decision journal, for one of the better, better term, you know, to kind of record uh, the the rationale which I, behind a, a particular bet, you know, why, how I, what, how I value it. Where it is valued at the moment, um, and maybe even why I've not looked at other bets. Because um, then, what I found is that uh, it's a useful tool to understand. You know, when you look back after a, a race or after a season, you can see, well, you know, what was I actually thinking at that stage? I might, I might have lost money, but you know, I can see that I can see how my the, the reasoning behind that. That, that position, it, it still makes sense. So going back, you know, I would still make the same the same choice, knowing the information I had had at the time, um, and also kind of looking at bets that I would have, you know, passed on at the time, and and kind of noting down why I've you know avoided doing those, and um, also helps as well because you know. You know, there's lots of different potential outcomes from a, an yeah. event. You know, we only see one, you know, one outcome, but there's you know, an infinite number of different outcomes. Um, and so, you know, understanding you know what could have happened is also quite quite interesting, you know, quite valuable. Do you, Anthony, want to to add something uh, to your? Uh like uh, improve ch change the, the changes you made in evaluating your own performance yeah, across so these years i'd probably start slightly different to the guys just because i started off being knowing nothing and when i could bet i didn't really know that much and i was kind of winging it and probably losing at the start and um, but then i kind of got my a lot of my knowledge and from actually just working in the bookmaking industry and finding out what bookmakers didn't like as, as the way to as the way to see the as the way to see the light basically the things that being in the back end of a bookmaker from when i was at university i worked in shops and then i worked at betfred's head office i worked at paddy power's head office paddy power betfred's head office and and i think just a good if a bookmaker's steering you one way you probably want to be going the other way and it's just doing it's doing the things that they don't want you to do basically is kind of it's kind of not a bad rule for, for where you'll find the money is basically. Um, so yeah, what the, if you're working at a bookmaker, the reasons, I think it's tough for people that work at bookmakers now. Like I, I do consider myself quite lucky to have started around 2008 ish just because there were smart smart customers that bookmakers did lay, like Betfred laid a lot of smart, high rolling customers and and Paddy Power would have done originally as well. Um, and just the way that the, the soft bookmaker model has kind of developed is that just 99.9% .9 of customers you're going to learn nothing from. They're just losing customers and they're just 
like anyone with a brain is restricted to nothing. So if you're starting out in the industry now as a trader, what are you going to learn? Like your, your customer base is rubbish. So you're not going to learn anything. You need to learn off people that are dealing with smart customers. You can only learn from people who are smarter than you um, at a certain thing. So if you're not laying smart customers, uh, as, as far as gambling goes, you need to you need to go somewhere else for your smart information. I think. Anthony, I've got a, a question for you, a personal question for you about this topic. Do you think that the fact that this uh, big soft, European softbooks don't lay smart customers anymore across the year will cause a degrading in the culture of the companies and the trader that are working there, creating less efficient odds over time? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I do agree with that, but I'd also wouldn't, I wouldn't put every single trader and risk manager at a company into the same bracket. I think, yeah, of course. I think as a general rule, yeah, but I think you get some very smart people that might have a big mortgage or they've got a few kids and it's just too much of a leap of faith to jump into doing professional gambling or doing something else. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a steady, no hassle job that they can do quite easily. And it, it brings in 50 grand a year and happy days. Um, and there's no real risk involved in the in the life decisions that you have to make, basically. Um, but I think, yeah, generally, yeah, I think when I started at Paddy Power Bedford, 90% of the people in the trading room would have been smarter than me. And when I left, you'd say you were not smarter than 90% of them, like not being degrading to, it's just, a, just a, in that specific making money. And I think it's the way, I think it's when bookmakers went on the stock market and the guys above weren't betting people and the guys above you, above the trading room became, well, we've got 200 staff in there. Can we do the same amount of work with 180 staff? And I think that's just, it's just the way it develops, but just the uh, other things come into play when your bookmaker is on the stock market and you're trying to save money and you're trying to post the best results and the chief exec leaves after three years with his golden handshake and his shares and it's it's all a little bit short term and growing in the next year or two. It's kind of why I don't think self regulation really works in the gambling industry. They kind of need kind of need a a, a, t a tough enough regulator to to come down on some of the practices. And so yeah, it's just it's just the way it's developed. Am I sad about that? No, it's just the way it is. I quite like thinking that I can be like you don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You just got to be smarter than the guy that's making the prices, basically. Sure. sure. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's that's what I say. I don't mean to be obtuse about that as well. Like I think I respect for a lot of people that still work for bookmakers as well. But like the general, like I, I still chat to some of the guys at Paddy Perbeck and some of the stories they tell me about the decision making and risk in certain areas is just you just wonder what the fuck is going on. Like, but, um, but yeah, it's just the way it's developed. Guys, we have a good question from Neil Penny, which. Uh, probably is more directed to the process of uh, Peter and Lorenzo. And it is, how much statistical analysis do you do based on historical data when it comes to your systems or betting in general? So Peter, if you may want to start. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that, that there is some element of that. Um, it does. It, it, it does vary um, depending on the type of market. So, you know, to give one example, like um, you know, whether it's going to be a safety car in a race that's reasonably um, reasonably reliable from a you know, from stats perspective. But I think I have to, I, you know because there might be twenty odd races during the year, but each of them have very different characteristics, and so you, you almost You've got such a small sample size, um, so yeah, it's limited to a certain range of bets, but not not something I I I, um, I do ma a massive amount on. Yeah, you Lorenzo a lot. <laughs> yeah, on on the contrary, basically perform like a lot of statistical analysis on you know different metrics, uh, different models that we try to backtest all the time. So. It's it's really takes the majority of time to develop those system to you know assess also also how they perform over time and backtest them basically. So it's it's really a big chunk of of 
of our work to you know build those systems and and still even in soccer you also have you know the small sample size problem because you know you, you don't have thousands of games in a season you you have some hundreds of them and then you know every season has its own of course make dynamics uh things can be quite different from year to year so despite you know having a strong and, and deep statistical database let's say it's not that easy to to you know handle those those statistics so it, it really requires a lot of time to to craft them and and to evaluate them all, all the time and actually th this brings me back to 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 the, uh, a previous question which mm, dealt with you know uh, biases and and how you design the system so for for me with which a lot of work is about you know building statistical um, systems it's really helpful to set uh, goals and targets before running the experiments so that that's another really important task that we where we try to put a lot of attention not not to be you know biased by data and and, and the things that you want to model so for for you peter it would be a complete nightmare because if you don't you know watch you know the the last games and and races it doesn't you know you don't have the the the, the data points to 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 make your own judgments but really we also try to not to look too much on on outcomes for maybe a period of time and see if then our assumptions are, are still valid after a while so it really helps to have these kind of also iterative approach where you you set some target and you don't proceed until you have found you know and beaten that that benchmark it, it really is 90 percent of our time in building models so it's it's a lot of time and uh, for you anthony um yeah i think it's hard to it's hard for me to answer the question to be honest with you like um so, for example, football, you'd, you'd have all your data points, you'd have your, you'd have your last price matched, you'd have, you'd have various opinions on if the game state is the same, what is the in-running price trade and that, you'd have, you'd have all your expected goals and your expected this and that, and um, you're just trying to, I'm just trying to get a number, so I'm using data from previous matches in that sense, um, but like statistics and like you find that there's a lot of layers. It's, it's, it's about how you use the data and how relevant the data is to how how relevant re relevant it is going forward, basically, as, as, a, as a predictive measure. Um, a lot of stuff. It's all about also what is not factored into the line. It's no good knowing certain things and if it's already been appropriately factored into the price. Um, so you're trying to find things that aren't factored into the price that have been under-considered rather than knowing something but if everybody else knows it as well what of what value is it to you um so i think that's a that's a good distinction um but yeah like you get like you get a lot of lazy basic analysis of people saying oh, this team have scored three goals in seven of the last eight games and things like that and like whenever someone comes out with a stat like that you you immediately know that well they've scored three in seven of the last nine because they would have said nine so like it's just like how uh, how how valuable is how valuable is that you can you, yeah. get, like, you get your sports it's, channels and your commentators saying oh they haven't won at this ground for twenty five years yeah. well they might have only played them twice and they might have been ten to one shots both of those times it's just irrelevant irrelevant things can get thrown uh, into the mix basically uh, basically it's astrology astrology <laughs> yeah. yeah basically exactly that yeah. so it's finding out what's relevant um, I agree with what Lorenzo said of you don't really you don't want to you don't want to have your conclusions drawn before you start back testing stuff mm. you can you can fit numbers to fit any scenario you can you can mess around with numbers to prove certain things or prove certain things um and how relevant is it as a predictive measure going forward that's what you're trying to you're trying to you're trying to work out what's predicted going forward and and what's not factored into the line or what's over factored into the line and what variable is is being over considered and there might be an angle playing against it if, if if the price is right basically okay there is a question guys that uh, is uh, like uh, perfect for anthony <laughs> listen this one because like it's one of your main topics on linkedin nice work guys with proposed affordability checks coming oh in God. the uk what effect do you think if it will have any on the industry 
Uh, oh, you're seeing, you're seeing in the UK what effect it's having. Like, the AML teams and customers are like a AML teams wind me up no end. They, they basically they're they're a box ticking exercise in these bookmakers. Bookmakers had the rule of the roost and they could lay they could take take a million quid off a problem gambler and he'd steal the money and so now we've got so now we've got the the case where there's over they're basically just trying to preempt they're basically just trying to trying to get ahead of what reviews coming coming down the line in the uk with the gambling review and they're just trying to they're just making it as awkward as possible for again no logic but more the other way and just hoping that the gambling review in the uk goes easy on them basically um some of the guys jesus christ i don't know who are in these aml teams but like bet for exchange is a particular book where i mean like bet for exchange are just useless for any kind of aml and asking for documents having problems with them again today um just someone suspending accounts proof of income well the accounts miles up that's my income oh no do you have a salary no i don't have a salary like it's just like it really is frustrating like the bet for exchange are doing all they can to get liquidity to zero so they can close the website i think it's just <laughs> it's an absolute pass what's going on at, at that company in my opinion um, that's a strong opinion man <laughs> yeah man it's fucking <laughs> i try i try, try and be less uh less emotional about it but uh geez, it really winds me up but but it's all because this gambling review is coming down the line which for me i don't think bookmakers have that much to fear from that gambling review i think a hundred quid limits on what's been talked about at the high end is just absolutely no chance of happening you can you can bet your bottom dollar these bookmakers will be greasing palms of lobbyists and they'll get looked after in the end and i've no i have no confidence of anything being done being done properly basically i think it'll uh it's all politics at the end of the day and uh everyone's playing the game aren't they yeah, peter see. do you want to add the something since you bet as well in the uk yeah um i don't know i don't think i've got anything really more to add than the answer but anyway, i know that there's you know the you know the, there's certainly um sort of know your know your customer um GFOS developing around, I mean, not just betting, but in your financial markets in general, isn't there? So, you know, it's, it's you know, there is a case for more regulation, and, and but I mean, it's going to be smarter regulation, hasn't it, really? And uh, you know, that benefits both both the customer and the, and the good maker. Yeah, I, I want to add something which is like, uh... It's harder to bet like uh, on Chelsea to win the Champions League rather than gambling your own funds uh, into the stock market nowadays <laughs> with 100% yeah. leverage and completely not uh, protected by any sort of regulation because your broker broker is based on a, an offshore paradise mm. and stuff like that, which I think is co completely crazy because you can get like 1000 leverage uh, easily. Uh, at 18 years old, but you can't bet uh, on uh, Chelsea to win the Champions League. Yeah. So, in my opinion, um, no, there's a, there's, a, there's plenty of inefficiencies like that. You can go to Iraq with a machine gun and a tank, and you can't yeah. drink down the off license. So, uh, like, there's, there's crazy, uh, crazy. You can't have a vault, but you can uh, you can go and shoot someone who's coming towards you with a gun in Iraq. So, crazy stuff. Okay, we have a question from Stan. Uh, we can start from Lorenzo. How do you think about the expected, uh, positive expected value uh, of your bets and what is good enough risk for you to place a bet? Uh, well, actually, the answer is going to be pretty simple. I mean, we, we like to set some minimum threshold for, for, for expected value on, on given markets. So according to how accurate our models are, we tend to require either more or less confidence uh, or, or expected value. So um, the way to think, I think it's, it's, it needs to be a, a, a number greater than zero. How much greater than zero really depends on, on, on your, you know, both confidence and also the types of operation you are doing, of, of course. 
Uh, I also like not to focus too much on the, let's say, proper definition of expected value, which is really skewed towards really high odds, for example. So uh, I also like to consider the, the, the simple difference between our own estimates and, and, and the implied probabilities by the market without you know, uh, multiplying by the factor of the odds, which would you know, require, uh, which would lead me basically to more expected value on shorter, on short, on, on, sorry, on longer odds. Uh, so basically that, that's how we, we think about it. We set some minimum threshold depending on the accuracy of our models. And, and as long as this minimum threshold is satisfied, we fire an order. That's, that's pretty simple and basic. And um, I would just set some, you know, sanity check on, on the odds. Uh, so we, 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 we will not place, I don't know, 200 to one odds even though they could have you know huge expected value uh actually it really depends on how much the expected value is but i, I would really doubt that you know such a high priced uh, uh fixture would have you know a, a, a fair odd produced by us which is really really probable so yeah i would just say cut on you know an upper limit on you know how often you expect to win and and down there you basically can set up your own thresholds according to your system maybe maybe other guys just need a slight edge and they can fire uh, so i will more than happy to hear what peter and anthony say say about this uh, but our approach is pretty pretty straightforward yeah um, yeah me anthony, first. we want to go first yeah, go on. Okay. Uh, uh, me personally, I I kind of use my own prices as a as a. I can only in real time when you're about to place a bet, I can only use what price I think something is, so I can price a market to a hundred percent, um, and then I'm trying to work out the difference between my price and the bookmaker's price to generate my expected value on the bet. I think that only works if you okay at pricing and your your prices are fairly accurate yourself or more accurate than the bookmakers prices so for me the whole process is about improving my own my own ability to price markets accurately um and that generates my ev based off the bets i'm having with the bookmakers basically simple enough like um but yeah a lot of my a lot of my work goes into just trying to improve improve my own pricing and make sure i'm not missing anything Thank you, Anthony. Uh, Peter, what about you? Yeah, yeah no, I think it's just, um, as I'm saying, just, you know, just, it goes back to you know, the start of our conversation about you know, focusing on the process and um, you know, ensuring that any, you know, the link between the you know, expected value and the amount you actually stake on that, that particular bet you know, is consistent with the, you know, the, your process and you know, your, you set out and you're not deviating too much from that. Um, so yeah. Okay, guys, since we surpassed the our benchmark, we'll do just the last question from the crowd, I think, before uh, every every one of us are going back to their respective families that uh, <laughs> are missing us. So this is a question not really Anto. <laughs> Anto is more a... Uh, uh, it's more about the, uh, where do we bet. So, do you bet only in Asia Exchange or also in soft Euro bookies? My answer is is simple: only on sharp, so on exchanges and in Asia. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me personally, exchanges and usually soft bookmakers, not because they're easy to beat, which they are more because i think that just in general the way pricing is going in the uk and just other jurisdictions it's kind of like in like in 2010 uk bookmakers didn't respect the bet for price as much as they should have done when there was liquidity there now they kind of respect it too much when there isn't liquidity there um, and I think it's kind of the same way that a lot of sports are going in the UK, that a lot of bookmakers, soft bookmakers are copying like pinnacle prices and they're not really doing much odds compilation. They're, they're, copying, they're copying what they perceive to be sharp bookmakers. 
And what we try and do is leave those sharp bookmakers alone. Like the, even the sharp bookmakers limits are much reduced of, of late in the last year or two. Um, and we try and avoid taking um, bets with the sharp bookmakers, even if we make them value. And we find that we can scale it a little bit better by just targeting the bookmakers that are copying the sharp bookmakers. Um, that's kind of the way that I kind of try and go about certain things. Like you'll see there'll be certain sports where Pinnacle have a, a market up that nobody could dream up that certain match bet on a certain sport or and you'll find that it pops up at different bookmakers all around the world just because the copy and pinnacle where you can move the pinnacle price for three and be clear you might as well move it the wrong way um, and get more on it in different parts of the world so i think that's the way it's kind of developing there's not many traders and there's a lot of people copying what they perceive as sharp book so you you just adapt, adapt your strategy and use that to your advantage basically Peter? Yeah, um, it used, used to be kind of very much focused on, on the exchanges, but I think that over the years that's, that's kind of dwindled. Over time, you know, much more focused on, on bookies and, um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, one thing I haven't mentioned, I guess it's sort of spread betting companies as well, um, that's an area I've focused on over the years, um, and especially it's been quite They've had some good markets over the years on, on Formula One that um, have been quite interesting. So, um, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the overall trend over the years. Okay, like, okay. just one question remains. I think we can just take the last five minutes and answer the very last question so everyone is happy. So, if your model um, suggest you two different bets on the same event guys in example home draw away and uh, under over 2.5 do you consider that like a double opportunity or a double exposure double opportunity <laughs> <laughs> who goes first <laughs> it's, it's probably both if, if, if they're very related and yeah, if they're, yeah. If they're very related markets it's going to be it's going to be both things um but if you're happy that you're price is right it should be both things in a positive way you're going to be at every single bet as an opportunity and exposure there that's the price <laughs> so uh yeah, yeah. Basically, it has both things but um if you're happy that your price is better than the market get stuck in yeah i, I would just say that it depends maybe you could maybe set up a, a maximum let's say exposure on a given event if maybe one of the two bet is i don't know with really large odds so maybe you want to maybe don't you want to stake a little bit less on 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 the higher one and getting you know more exposure on the most probable it, it's something that makes sense but if those odds are equivalently good of course you have some risk because let's say that you i mean in our case we have some models that have some opinions on that market that so there is some sort of slight concentration risk but I would say that the benefits overcome, you know, the cost. So I would go double down on, on that, on that value bet, basically. Um, so my take is if there is value, you, you just go and get it. Peter, do you want to end with something? I don't know in Formula One market if that's <laughs> yeah, the case. Two value oh, bets yeah. in the same. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll send you, uh, yeah, you just got to wait patiently enough for, uh, value to lie lie in the corner and then you just go and pick it up that's that's, that's awesome for it. Yeah. <laughs> cool okay okay uh, okay thanks uh, to everyone for this uh, table talk i hope that uh, all of you three enjoyed it uh, and that my moderation was uh, well enough for being my first time oh, yeah. so i think that uh, great, everything great went pretty well <laughs> so yeah. Uh, thanks uh, to everyone. Uh, guys, if someone wants to reach out to you, where uh, they can contact you? Uh, to, to me, you can shoot an, e shoot, uh, shoot an email to Lorenzo at Mercurius.io uh, or, or, or write directly to Carlo, which is maybe a better decision as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same. Contact Carlo. <laughs> <No>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, um, broken YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just on LinkedIn for me. Yeah, and then uh, for me uh, on Twitter, it's um, at Peter Sainsbury7. Cool. Cool. Okay. Uh, thanks to all of you. Now yeah. I'll end the broadcast and uh, see you the next time. Ciao. Hoping to see you guys in front of a beer sooner or later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sounds good. It was fun. <laughs>